He's from Physical Institute of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and he will be talking about velocity gradient fluctuations in Lagrangian model of turbulence. So please. August. 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 Um, yeah. Expired. I was refreshing it from a previous seminar, so I forgot to change the month. You see, it's summertime. Summertime. Sorry for that. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about basically the same problem as the one that was discussed here by Leonardo Gregorio, but I would say that they have a very nice solution and no corrections. I have a very bad solution with corrections. And uh, it, it happens that we can go f further in the coupling constant of the model and compare with some uh, uh, PDFs which uh, show intermittency, okay? So uh, I, I'm going to discuss here, I'm going to, dis to review a, a work that was done in collaboration with uh, Rodrigo Pereira and Leonardo. Last, it was published last year in the JSTAT. And basically in this paper, you have, we have considered one diagram, one Feynman diagram. And here we have, uh, we, we, we have extended the analysis to see what are the subdominant uh, corrections to the problem. And this was done with the help of Gabriel Apolinario, the gentleman over there, who is doing his PhD at the Federal University. Okay. So I will start with some uh, uh, motivation here. This first part of the talk, I think, that would be good for the students. Sorry? It's, uh, yeah, it's diffuse. I mean, it's a special effect. Yeah. <laughs> is it okay? Is there another one? I thought that the IMPA was perfect, Alexei. Yeah. So yeah, it's I'm too happy too to too see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I will start with some uh, uh, review of the base phenomenology of autistic strain, just to give some motivation why the problem is interesting, why is it, why the problem is off worth of uh, uh, studying. Okay, think about um, okay. okay. And uh, then I will jump to the Lagrangian approach. The model is the same. It's the Chev Chevillar uh, Menevo uh, model. Okay. Then I will discuss the field theoretical formulation of the problem. It's the MSR formulation, the Martin C.J. Rose. The Martin C.J. Rose is the great star of this workshop, okay? I learned that, uh, I mean, if you go to the paper, it's interesting. The paper by Martin C.J. Rose is a canonical paper. There is no path integral in the paper, but everybody refers to the Martin C.J. Rose as the functional formalism. Okay, that's an interesting historical. By, by, it's totally by who? Uh -huh. Wild, wild, yeah, right. It's just totally equivalent. Equivalent. Yeah, yeah. It's based on Green's no, functions. Blah, blah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Green's function approach, wild yeah. approach, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And then I will do some comparisons between the analytical results and the empirical uh, velocity gradient PDFs. And then finally, we will comment on uh, open issues and, and uh, things that should be tried in the future. So this is a, uh, I mean, very famous uh, picture of the a turbulent flow, homogeneous and isotropic uh, flow. In this green, uh, in this image, you have these green tubes here. They are just the regions where you have vorticity, a huge uh, concentration of vorticity lines. These are the regions where vorticity is the strongest one. And here you see that you have these dark regions where you don't have vorticity. This is the picture of intermittency in space, okay? Of course, in this simulation, I mean, the, the tubes, are, they are moving. It's a dynamical uh, thing. So if you have a sensor here at this point, in this moment, the sensor will not uh, probe anything. But as soon as there is a vortex tube crossing the sensor, you have a spike in your signal. This is 
then this is uh, what we, we, we assume it's intermittent in time, okay? These are the simulations that were done by uh, the Japanese group a while ago in the Earth Simulator in Japan, very nice things. So the two important questions here are, how are these tube-like structures produced and how are uh, uh, they related to the intermittence phenomenon? Okay. So, well, we, we don't know exactly how they are produced, by, but we are most sure that it has to do with the coupling between the rate of the strain tensor, S, and the rotation tensor, okay? So if you start with the average stokes equation, you can derive a, a set of coupled equations that uh, couple the strain and rotation. You can see from here that these equations, they are uh, non-local and non-linear, so it's a really tough problem to, to uh, solve these equations, but nature provides us with two basic, very beautiful mechanisms. One, uh, one is the, what, we, we, what we, we may call the hurricane mechanism, the other one is the shear flow instabilities. So here's this uh, image of a hurricane. In the core of the hurricane, you have a hot spot in the ocean. So I have flow of air towards the center, okay? The, the, the air that goes to the center raises to the sky. And then by conservation of circulation, Kelvin's theorem, you have the production of a hurricane. This is uh, how uh, a vortex, strong vortex tube can be formed in nature, is one of the mechanisms. Another mechanism is related to instabilities. So here you have a hole and you have a, a flow of fluid going uh, outside of this hole. Then you produce a, a, a shear layer here and we know because of the Kelvin and Helmholtz uh, instabilities, you have this formation of tubes here. And uh, in fact, some, some of the structures like this one, atmospheric structures can be produced in this way too. It seems that our hurricane, the Brazilian hurricane, the only one, uh, Catarina, was produced in this way, in the south of Brazil, I think in 2004. Okay. So these are the only two basically known uh, physical mechanisms for the production of uh, vortex tubes. And what we think is that in homogeneous turbulence, this is what you find, something like that. Okay. This one is more like related to meteorological science, atmospheric things, okay? Well, uh, intermittency is basically the thing that if you have some uh, observable of interest in your uh, uh, fluid dynamical system, okay, you can find some very strong and long ocean fluctuations. So you, you find uh, eventually strong fluctuations uh, which appear uh, more frequently than if you would have a Gaussian uh, distribution of fluctuations. This was found, it was discovered long ago by Bachelor and Townsend in, in England. It was a remarkable discovery. They, they were using analog, analog uh, methods like oscilloscopes, things like that. So it's amazing how it was uh, discovered by them in 1949. Okay, so here, for instance, this is a result of a numerical simulation for the circulation. So uh, when, you, when you change the radius of a circle, of a circumference, depending on the radius, you can find stronger or weaker uh, fluctuations. So if the radius is very large, you have a Gaussian uh, PDF, okay? You have many vortices crossing the, 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 the circle. While if you have a, uh, a smaller circle, then you start to see fluctuations which are uh, very strong, okay? This is another example. This is S here is the velocity difference in two uh, different points in the inertial range in a turbulent flow. You have here this uh, really uh, fat tails. So this is very far from a Gaussian. This is a work by Tabelin in 1996. But if you go to the literature, you will find it's a, uh, I mean, there are many, hundreds of papers where you can find behavior like this one, okay? So uh, our main interest here is the, the physics of velocity gradients in, in turbulence, since they are related to the formation of the uh, vortex structures in the flow, okay? So this is what you get if you do measurements. This is the profile of the uh, velocity gradients. These are measurements 
that were performed by the Tel Aviv group, by uh, Gulitsky, Komiansky, Kinzelbach, Lutit, Snober, and Jurich. Okay. Here I have PDFs for the diagonal and for the non-diagonal components of the velocity gradients. So this uh, uh, solid uh, uh, black curve here, this is the uh, diagonal for the diagonal components of the velocity gradient. You see that there is a skewness in the PDF, okay? And the color red ones, uh, they refer to the non-diagonal components. They are symmetric, no skewness here. These are perhaps the measurements that were uh, performed with the hugest, largest uh, Reynolds number in, in, in both in the experiments or in the simulations, okay? And also, okay, this is an interesting review also by uh, Jim Wallace and Peter uh, vukus Electivich, annual review of fluid mechanics. These guys were the first ones to measure vorticity uh, in the lab, vorticity fluctuations in the lab. So you see, it's a very intermittent distribution. And uh, in fact, the kurtosis of this the distribution, it grows really fast with the uh, Reynolds number. This is something that we can, you can also model using a cascade picture of turbulence. Okay, how this uh, skewness, how the skewness and the kurtosis, they change with the uh, Reynolds number, okay? So, well, this was a uh, general motivation for the prob problem. And uh, here we would like to, I would like to address uh, our approach, is a Lagrangian approach. So we, we are just, our, the idea is to see turbulence from the point of view of a particle that moves along with the fluid. This is the Lagrangian trajectory. Here we have a reference frame, fixed reference frame, Cart Cartesian coordinates here, okay. And, uh, so how, how it was discussed by uh, Leonardo, there is this model, interesting model, the recent fluid deformation closure model, RFDC. It's a kind of complex acronym. I don't like it very much, but anyway. Um, where you, you do some tricks, some interesting tricks to simplify the structure of your uh, differential equation. So if you start, a here is a matrix, okay? So this is, uh, this is what you get from the Navier-Stokes equation. More, more precisely, this is what you get from a stochastic hydrodynamics. So forcing here is a stochastic forcing. FF is a delta correlating time, okay? And uh, this V of A, this is a functional. It's a non-local and non-linear functional of the velocity gradient. So here you have uh, all the complexity of this equation, okay? This is the viscose term, all right? The correlation function uh, is uh, also, you have this uh, tensor here, fourth order tensor, can be written this way. This is a direct consequence of isotropy and the homogeneity in your, pro in your problem, okay? So what is the approximation? Yeah, the approximation that was discussed by, by Leonardo is that blob deformation. You follow the blob, a blob of fluid for a small time, a uh, time of the order of tau. It's the same, the same, it's the same model. The model tau. is the same, yeah. It's just a similar minimum. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. And, uh, okay, so here we have, uh, this is uh, replacing the, the pressure term. The term that, uh, it was, uh, the pressure is here, is hidden here. It is no local contribution. Okay, it's the pressure Hessian here. And here you have a replacement for the viscose term. This is a linear damping term. And here I have something that's quadratic in the velocity gradient. Okay, so it's a much simpler model. Is uh, you, you, the problem is reduced to the problem of a stochastic uh, uh, ordinary differential equation for the matrix A. So here I have, a, it's a three by three matrix. You have nine components. It's traceless. The matrix, the matrix is traceless because you have uh, incompressibility in the, in the flow. Okay. And also, you can uh, parameterize the regions of this uh, flow by this Reynolds number. It's a, it's an artificial Reynolds number. In fact, you can, you can't compare it to the real Reynolds number for uh, DNS, for instance. 
Okay, it's the ratio, square of the ratio between these two time scales in the problem. There is another important. If the model is, is not stable, right? So it's not what? It, it is not stable, right? The model. If you change the Reynolds number at some point, this is. Right. If, if the Reynolds number is larger than. What happens? I don't remember. You will find. Uh, what do you find? Does I mean, it blow up? It, 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 no, no, it, it doesn't blow up, but the PDFs will get strange shapes and everything goes yeah, wrong. So it's, it's a model, we should, we should see this model as a model for the outset of intermittency. It's a model where, where you can control a parameter and see a Gaussian phase and something like intermittency appearing in the model. But, but don't hope it to, to provide nice answers for uh, 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 a very intermittent flow, okay? Also, another sh shortcoming of the model is that if you compute the correlation function of A, let's say AT, AT prime, the correlation function in time, you see that this uh, decays with time scale based on capital T and not on tau, small tau. And this is, you know that if you do, I mean, if you do a DNS and you compute these correlation functions, this correlation function, the decay of A is regulated by the small time scale, the dissipative time scale, and not by the large one. So this is a severe problem with the model. So it's a model, it's a nice, it's a toy model, in fact, of intermittency, okay? Uh, all right, so this is a strange object. Is the, uh, here I have the Cauchy green tensor that gives you the deformation of this blob along the Lagrangian trajectory. And what you can do is just to expand these in power series in tau, okay? And then work with a local model where you have many uh, monomials for this uh, uh, field here, A, okay? So what do you get? If you expand it up to second order in tau, you get a series of terms here up to fourth order in the velocity gradient uh, tensor, okay? So you see that here, the trace of A is zero, so you don't worry with this term here. V1 and V2, V1 is linear in A, V2 is uh, proportional to the square of A, V3, you have cubic power here, V4, you have fourth power of A. So it's uh, you, you, what you, you are studying an uh, ordinary uh, stochastic differential equation where you have terms that, goes, that go up to the fourth order here in A. Okay, and you'll do the same here with the uh, dissipation term. All right. So uh, this model, can be uh, approached with these tools of uh, field theory uh, techniques. Okay, I think that I mean, this is what we have been seeing here all the time, all the talks, basically. If, if you have, a, let's say, a scalar field, phi dot, which is uh, equal to some functional of phi plus some stochastic noise here, a random noise correlated in some arbitrary way, you can map this problem into a field theory I mean by field theory, uh, uh, path integral here. So we have a, a functional, a generating functional uh, of the Green's functions. So using this path integral, we can compute all the correlations you, you, you want to compute. Here, S is the so-called Mortensius and Rose action. So here you see the equation of motion for the phi field. Here phi hat is the auxiliary field that is introduced in the model is related to the correlation force force correlation function, okay? All right, these were the guys that introduced the uh, path integral version of the martin Seger rose canonical uh, form of this. Okay. All right. The statistical interpretation of this uh, object Z is that it gives to you the conditional probability density functional to find some specific configuration phi two, let's say at time t two, once you know that you, you had phi one at time t one. So if you are able to compute this path integral okay, with the boundary conditions given by phi one at time t one and configuration phi two at time t two, you have to sum over all the paths, okay? Then you have the conditional probability density functional to get these configurations here a lot of time little time, okay. So in the particular case of this uh, model, the Fevilar-Menevo model, you get 
this is the, the conditional probability distribution function. So let's say that at time zero, you have A naught. At time beta, you have A1, okay? So you are interested in, in, the, in the transition from A naught to A1 during time uh, uh, beta, okay? Here I have the path integral. Here I have the martin seizure rose action designed for the Chevilla uh, Meneva model, okay? with this boundary condition. So in the path integral, we have to fix the configuration of the velocity gradient as n naught at time zero and has a, a of beta at time a1. Okay. Here, L is the, is the contribution that, has, that have all the nonlinear terms here added in the action. Okay. So here I have a quadratic contribution and LA will bring to the action uh, lots of contributions, nonlinear contributions uh, to the action, okay? So uh, the general strategy to, to work out with this problem, this is what was done uh, two years ago with the collaboration of Rodrigo and, and Leonardo, is uh, the following one. It's just assume the existence of some solutions. Let's call these solutions the instantons, AS and A hat S. S here stands for the saddle point, okay? Sorry, the saddle point again is uh, in which limit? In the small uh, forcing limit? Any, any one. Just take, assume that you have these solutions for any G and tau and T, capital T. Assume that you have these solutions here, okay? The saddle point equations for the martin seizer rose action, okay? Then what you do, you just replace the field, original fields by the saddle point plus fluctuations. Then you go to the action and do this substitution, okay? Then you can see that the action can be uh, uh, written as a sum of, very, of, of, of some terms, okay, of four terms. So as this first term here is the sum of contributions, sum of contributions that depend only on the instant on configurations, okay? You have this uh, delta S naught, the first one, is the sum of contributions up to quadratic order that are independent on the instant configuration. So you, why, why, why you do this? Just to separate what is quadratic from what is uh, non-quadratic, what is going to be treated as a perturbation, okay? And the second contribution is the sum of contributions that go be beyond the quadratic order, independent on the instant configurations, these ones, okay? And finally, this last contribution here is the sum of contributions that depend both on the instantons and on the fluctuating fields, okay? So you can, you can classify all the terms in this way, these four ways, okay? And then what do you do? You apply the, the cumulant expansion up to second order to compute what is remaining here, okay? The mean value of exponential minus delta, delta S not the second term, plus delta S1, okay? If you do that, you get an action that will depend only on the instant on fields, on the saddle point uh, fields. And this will give you some answer for the, uh, for the probability distribution function to find a specific configuration of the velocity gradient tensor. So this is a, this is a perturbative program. It's a, it's a standard way of doing things in, uh, in, in field theory, okay? It's a related to the loop expansion here. It's not equivalent because when you do the, the cumulant expansion, you have diagrams that have more than one loop. So, so what we do here is just to uh, uh, drop these extra diagrams. They will contribute, contribute less to the action. I, I think this will be clear in the next slide. Sorry? They are one PI, one PI. They are not connected, more than connected, okay? So this, uh, this structure of the perturbative expansion is this one. You have, a, for the quadratic, quadratic term, you have a vertex, simple vertex, which is of the order of G squared plus, uh, and the uh, order of tau to the power. It's that, it doesn't depend on tau, Sorry, okay? The, the, the term that does not depend on tau is the VAFOS model. Sorry? The term the, the diagrams that do not depend on tau would be there even if you just integrate the JFOS model. I'm not sure about that. 
mean, tau equals zero is the day false model, right? The, the Sharia Menevo equations, if you put tau equals zero, is the day false model. Am I but, right? But, I mean, but you have the damping term. Okay, but yeah. Plus, well, yeah, 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 okay. Plus yeah, yeah, right. I mean, we can say that, yeah. Okay. So you should be fully dominated by the VAA false. Uh, right, VAA. right. You want to see a teardrop image, right? Sorry? You, you want to see a teardrop image? No, no, no. I, I, I'll, I'll show it to you. Yeah, from, yeah. Where you, from where you start. So you, you right. start uh, the, 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 the unperturbed situation right. is the VAA false model in some sense. Right. You can, you can put it this way. So yeah. It's, an it's, right. even, it's even integral. Yeah. Yeah, so in some sense you are considering fluctuations around the view of also, view of also, uh, uh, model, right? But they have this cause. They have this cause. They have this cause. So that's why they don't have finite time singularity. Because the view of also is purely unviscous. Right, but what I'm saying is that there are two things. One is the geometry of the passing phase space, this line. Uh, and second is the evolution along this line. Yeah. Evolution could be different. The line itself is just given by by by, geom by topology of your configuration. By the way, I'm not sure if the, the false model plus viscosity. Uh, I don't know. I'm not How sure. How do you put viscosity there? You cannot. Sorry? You cannot put viscosity there. Uh, yeah, you put there. We have a damping term, linear damping yeah. here. Linear damping. Linear damping. I, I call it viscosity. And yeah. Stop yeah. right? The linear damping stops linear the singularity. Yeah. He claims, he claims it does. It does. It does. Linear theory, how it can stop, how it can stop non-linear well. blow up. I think that not for all values of viscosity it can stop singularity. No, linear term cannot stay blow up. Not, not, no, not for all the values of the linear damping. Okay, okay. let's give speaker, let's give speaker to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, linear, let's call it, let's call it a linear damping. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> problem. <laughs> Maybe you should call Lohan and ask him. But anyway. What? But, it, but it, if you remove the linear damping, then you have singularity. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, linear damping is what is blocking the singularity. So let's, let's, for, these are the vertices in perturbative ex expansion. So each one of these uh, drawings here, they are associated to terms in the martin cj rose action. So for instance, this one here with these two incoming lines, these are, this is the vertex associated to the a hat a hat, that is to the force force correlation function. Th that symbol that that nice uh, draw is associated to this term. And here I have a series of terms that are associated to these other uh, vertices here. So this is a term like A hat AA. It has this structure, okay? This is, uh, here we have three legs associated to, oops, I missed one A here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it took, uh, well, uh, uh, right. Yeah, and here you have four legs associated to terms like that. Okay, so uh, incoming lines are associated to a hat. Outgoing lines are associated to the velocity gradient field in these uh, uh, representation, the time diagrams. And also, of course, you need a propagator. This is a propagator. It's a casual, casual propagator. So you have a uh, have side data function here, propagates from the solid line, a solid star circle to the crust one, okay? So this is, these are the basic, basic uh, building blocks of uh, perturbative expansion in the problem, okay? All right, so in, in that program here, 
we had three steps. The first one was to find some uh, instantons, some side of points for the problem. I said that my instantons are not fancy like the ones that were sh shown before by, by Leonardo. It's just a simple co hyperbolic cosine. This is the set of point that you get if you just neglect completely the nonlinear terms in your action, okay? So you, 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 you pretend that you are working with a linear theory, and this is the, the side of point that you get from this uh, uh, exercise, all right? Okay, but if you have a bad solution, you have to correct it in some uh, way, and you do this by just establishing a calculus of fluctuations around the instantons. Okay, so what you do is just replace the, you, you replace the original fields by the instanton, instantons uh, plus fluctuations. And then you have uh, further terms in your action like these ones. So these, the original term, you had two solid lines here. Now you have just, you have this dashed line here which is associated to the saddle that was attached to this vertex here. And you do the same for the, all the other terms in your action. So it, in this way, you will generate a lot of terms in the action. It, in, in fact, you have lots of terms. Gabriel is uh, the guy that was tough enough to do this kind of computation. And uh, in step three, you want to do the, the cumulant expansion with this, okay? So you, you have to understand how the diagrams, they contribute to uh, the, the action. So if you take a diagram of, uh, which has uh, L loops, E external incoming lines, okay? And uh, N3 and N4 vertices of types uh, with three legs, three A legs and four A legs, okay? you find that this diagram is not a difficult thing to, to prove. You find that this diagram contributes with a g squared g uh, to the power of 2 times L plus E minus 1 times tau and 3 plus 2 and 4. So each diagram, you have a contribution that uh, has some power of g and some power of tau. In tau in the model, tau is general, is a small parameter, it's like 0 0.1, okay? And here in their model, g goes up to 1 at most. After, after g equals 1, you, you start to, to get some uh, strange things in the model. So it's, this is the range of uh, validity of the model. So, so this is an example where you have two loops here. Okay? So this diagram is associated to a contribution like this one. So here you have two incoming lines. The dashed lines, they are associated to these two terms here, a hat s, a hat s. And here I have four outgoing lines. Sorry, three. Yeah, I, I am having problem, problems here counting legs. So here I have AS and AS and AS, okay? You have these uh, internal uh, vertices here. And uh, at the end, you find that this diagram contributes with something like G to the power six times tau to the power three. Sorry? Bear, yeah, right, right. Not renormalized one. I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do. I'm going to do. This, uh, I'm going to renormalize the this vertex by one loop correction. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, an interesting thing to note here is that this is a detail with a model. Every time you substitute the AS hat by the saddle point, but every time you use the A hat solution, you introduce a factor of one over G squared in the model. So this E contribution here drops out and uh, you find that the contribution is really proportional to G to some power related to the number of loops, like you have in usual quantum field theory, okay? It's a loop expansion, in fact. Okay. So what, uh, what, what uh, we did, what Gabriel did, in fact, was to take a look at all the diagrams that are produced with the cumulant expansion and select the ones that were the, the, the most relevant ones, okay? So we have to, to, to take a look at the G power here and the tau also, okay? And select the ones that are the most relevant. 
So this one, the first one, the dominant one, this is the diagram that was considered in the work, the previous work, the work that we did with Leonardo and uh, uh, Rodrigo, okay? And this one is an extra term. You have an extra contribution here, one loop also, which will modify the propagator, okay? But the point is that this contribution is going to be important, not at the core of the PDFs, but at the details of the PDFs, okay? So we, you do all the steps, and then you find uh, uh, saddle point action like this one. So these A and B here, they, they are related to the noise renormalization, renormalization that is uh, carried at one loop order by this extra diagram here, okay? This comes from this A and B. So A and B, they are given by these expressions, X and Y, these uh, are given by these uh, expressions here. And so here I have the corrections associated to the noise renormalization, okay? Otherwise, you ha would have uh, here numbers that are independent on G here. And uh, the propagator renormalization, this extra diagram, will appear here in this expression only in the V1 contribution, which is the contribution associated to the uh, propagator in the uh, Martin Cesar Rose uh, action, the two point uh, vertex there. Okay. All right, so this is, if, okay, if you, if you take the exponential of this action, then you have an answer for your PDF, okay? But the problem is that your PDF will depend on uh, matrix. It's difficult to plot a matrix which depends on eight parameters. So we had to do a, a Monte Carlo analysis of this uh, PDF, of this analytical PDF, okay? So the Monte Carlo goes like that. You just, you propose some changing in the velocity gradient field using uh, the measure based on this action. And then in this way, you generate a sample, a sample to uh, produce the statistics you, you want to compute, okay? So this is a special set of matrices that uh, parameterizes the traceless uh, matrices in a uh, lost gradient space. And here are the results. These are the results based only on renormalization of, uh, of uh, noise, okay? So at left, you have, uh, uh, at left is what you get if you don't renormalize anything, okay? So these uh, colored curves here, they are results of the numerical simulation of the model, okay? And the black lines are the PDFs you get uh, without renormalization. So if you see that if G is very small, well, uh, here you have a, a 0.2, okay, everything is okay. You don't need to renormalize because the coupling constant is small, all right? So the result is good. But as you increase the value of G, you start to see a uh, discrepancy between the analytical PDF and the uh, P, uh, numerical PDF you get from the uh, experiment, from the numerical ex experiment. This is the diagonal. This is from the, for the non-diagonal components of the velocity, velocity gradient, and this is for the diagonal component of the velocity gradient. So you have a huge discre discrepancy here. But if you include the re uh, re noise renormalization here, you can find that you have an agreement here, for instance, you have a G equal uh, zero, uh, 0, 0.8. You have a nice agreement, much better than the one that you get uh, without renormalization. And here, for G equal the square root of two, this is in the borderline of perturbation theory. You have a very nice agreement between the analytical and the numerical uh, PDFs. Okay. Here again, you have the same kind of thing for the diagonal components of the velocity gradient uh, matrix. Okay. Okay. Yes. I would say that my expansion parameter here is G, is, is the intensity. Is it small? Yeah. No, no, I'm not working. At, no, no. No, no. Why not? Why not? I have, a, I have a parameter, the Reynolds number, but I have a different one, which, is, which gives the intensity of the, of the noise. And but you look at it, it clearly works, but not very large value of gradient. In the sense, you may say that your value of gradient is Here. Parameter, yeah. Like you do renormalization, and it improves, but except this 
Yeah, but but, here, but but here we are very far from the standard deviation. Yeah. Okay, you go very far from the standard deviation. Yeah. Yeah. These ones, uh, Rodrigo, white, help me. Uh, yeah. The point is Gaussian should not be picking not a Gaussian. Uh, you're right. Here you, you don't have, yeah. But uh, I mean, OK, we have checked that. So here, for instance, yeah. I, I, you go far. At least you, you go three, three sigma. Three sigma. But not 15. No. But you, you can have a feeling on, on this. Yeah, no, this is not really normalized with the, with the yeah. So if you take a look at the linear, this is log monolog. So if you take a look at the linear, 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 then you have a better feeling of it. This is uh, with no renormalization whatsoever here. And here we have noise renormalization. So I have a nice agreement. To the eyes, it's perfect. To the eyes, you can see when you have the part or here, the tails. So I would say that. I mean, you really, sigma is OK. Two sigma, three sigma here, they are well done with this noise renormalization. Okay. And you can try also the teardrop shape. So here I have Q and R, the geometrical uh, invariants in the problem. This is what you get from the numerical. So this is, these are the level curves for the joint probability distribution, okay, Q and R. And this is what you get from the analytical renormalized uh, distribution. So if you take a look here around the origin, it's, it's basically the same. You have some departure here, details, of course. But it's a kind of satisfying picture of the problem. In which part of the should be deviated more? Is the lower corner? Uh, you see here? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you have a kind of strong fluctuation here, yeah, What's right. The way to Sorry? What's the way to singularity? <laughs> right. Yeah. OK, so uh, this was uh, taking into account just one diagram, this one, this diagram. So we would like to, to see if we can get improvements considering now the subdominant diagrams that should work for the tail. So you can see here that you have, uh, I mean, we, we, we would like to fix these tails. This is what we wanted to do, okay? Just by including subdominant terms in the, in the problem. And, uh, okay, so here is uh, an example with G equal, equals to uh, o, uh, 0.8 and tau uh, 0.1. This pink curve here is uh, non, uh, the result of the non-renormalized action. Here in green, you have the renormalized noise. And here with the blue one, you have then the renormalized uh, action, including this uh, subdominant contribution. So you can see that the shape is a little better. You can fix a little bit the tails here for the non-diagonal uh, fluctuations, okay? But the problem is that then you get, then you mess up the diagonal thing, the diagonal fluctuations that were very well modeled by these, uh, in incredibly well modeled by, by noise uh, renormalization. Then now you get some bad fluctuations here. You can map it, you can model it very well. It's, it's funny that you, you, you fix one of the distributions by the other one gets messed. And here, so we, 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 this, this may be the symptom of, uh, of the fact that you are going away from the perturbative regime. G can be uh, really, uh, I mean, this is, is close to the borderline for the validity of uh, perturbation theory. So we reduce G, okay? And reducing G, uh, okay, with the non-diagonal, you, you, you get a very good agreement with the subdominant contribution. But here, okay, things uh, get a little bit better, but it's still uns unsatisfactory here. So, it, it, okay, it's better than the non-normalized one, and it's comparable to the renormalized one. But this is something that we should try to 
to understand better why the non-diagonal, why the diagonal fluctuations are bad behaved if compared to the uh, non-diagonal ones. Okay, so well, just to state some conclusions and comments. It turns out that the effective action approach in this model, it's a, it's a really, I mean, useful. We, we should try to take a look at, at different models like the Burgess model, Shell models, MHD, whatever you want. Yesterday, Grisha gave a nice talk about this uh, 2G uh, turbulence model where basically you have a similar strategy. You have the cumulant expansion in an effective action approach. Okay. I mean, but I, I think that an interesting message from this formalism is that you can, you can, you can uh, reproduce some intermittency for the velocity gradient fluctuations from the marginal PDFs for the single components working <coughs> with some uh, perturbation around side points for the joint PDFs. So uh, in some senses, it's like, okay, it's, it's not so difficult to get the joint PDFs and once you have the joint PDFs, when you integrate over the other components to get the marginal PDFs, you get intermittency, which could be eventually compared to what you have in experiments and numerical uh, simulations. Okay. Also, something interesting, I think, from this analytical approach is that if you have an analytical uh, PDF, it's, uh, this is a nice tool to work out uh, conditional statistics. You don't have to wait your numerical series to reach some condition because this way you would have a poor sampling. But here you have an analytical form for the PDF. You can produce from Monte Carlo statistics, which is uh, conditioned from the start. So this can be a very nice tool to work with some geometrical statistical problems in turbulence, I think. Okay. We have this problem, something that we would like to understand better, why fluctuations in the diagonal components of the velocity gradient tensor seem to be sensitive only to noise randomization, why the subdominant uh, contributions seem seems to they seem to spoil the the nice uh, uh, PDF profile. Okay, and of course we'd like to to work with impro improved closures for Lagrangian models. This is a toy model. We feel that maybe uh, it it would be possible to work out with some model, simple model, closed model that could uh, reproduce some of the nice statistical features of the velocity gradient tensor. Okay. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention.